Hi, welcome to Numeric's video blog. I'm your host, Jim Jockel. With me today uh, via Google Plus uh, is renowned quantitative uh, researcher and academic John Hull. Um, for those of you who don't know uh, uh, John, John is the author of several widely acclaimed books on derivatives and risk management, including the newly released third edition of Risk Management in Financial Institutions. Welcome, John, and thank you so much for joining us. That's fine, Jim. Pleased to be here. Uh, so, John, uh, your recent research has focused on FEA and you've been an important player in the industry debate around it and much of this ongoing FEA discussion centers on whether funding adjustment is appropriate for derivative prices and some arguing some are arguing excuse me that FEA is an integral component of OTC derivatives pricing while others like yourself make the case that FEA is not necessary and in violation of fundamental asset pricing theory um, what are the issues that people on both sides of this debate are, are in disagreement about? Well, well, Jim, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, when Alan and I, that was, that's my colleague Alan White and I, first wrote this article for Risk Magazine, I think it was back in July this year, uh, there was a huge amount of, we, I mean, we never expected there to be the huge amount of controversy and debate and interest that there has been. We received no end of emails about the article. And I think the reason is there's lots of arguments on both sides here. I mean, the arguments that we used, um, I'll start with those. Uh, I mean, for, first of all, in any sort of traditional corporate finance course that you might get taught at university, we make the argument that uh, investment decisions should be kept separate from financing decisions. The decision about whether to go ahead with an investment should depend on the risk of that investment. It shouldn't depend on the average funding costs of the company that's doing the investment. So that was one point. So you know, FEA is sort of mixing up the funding uh, of derivatives from uh, <clears throat> from you know how attractive those derivatives are as investments. So that you know that was the you know that was the first point in our argument. We also talked about uh, risk neutral valuation, which is a long established principle in the pricing of derivatives. And um, basically risk neutral valuation argues that if you, if you assume the world's risk neutral, you get the right price, not just in the risk neutral world, but in all other worlds as well. So that's an argument in favor of discounting at the risk free rate and not mixing it up with funding costs. And then the third, uh, third, third type of argument that we had was um, concerned with the relationship between FVA and something called DVA, which is a firm's own funding, uh, so, sorry, own credit risk adjustment. So th those were the sort of arguments that we had on our side of the debate. The arguments on the other side were um, <clears throat> if, I mean, let's just take the example of a bank's funding costs being the risk-free rate plus 200 basis points. Um, the bank's got, got to recover that risk-free rate plus 200 basis points. The funding desk will charge the derivatives desk the risk-free rate plus 200 basis points, and so the derivatives desk better earn the risk-free rate plus 200 basis points. Um, so, um, you know, the, the arguments from the other side were more about flows of funds within the bank and um, whether the funds that were flowing from one part of the bank to another part of the bank were getting, um, you know, was getting an adequate return on those funds. I mean, I think the sort of debate one gets into here is something like the following, and, and indeed we have got into this debate with a lot of different people. I mean, let's suppose a bank does fund itself at the risk-free rate plus 200 basis points, and it comes across this investment which is almost risk-free, of course, nothing's ever totally risk-free. It's almost risk-free, but it returns the risk-free rate plus 150 basis points. So it's a great investment, almost risk-free, but it's giving you 150 basis points above the risk-free rate, but the bank's funding itself at the risk-free rate plus 200 basis points. So should you go ahead with that investment? I mean, that's, you know, that, you know, that's perhaps what, um, you know, a lot of the debate we've had with people are centered around. We would argue, yes, you should. It's a great investment. What you should do is to look at the riskiness of that investment in deciding whether you should go ahead with it, not worry about um, what the average funding costs of the bank is, because those average funding costs relate to the average risk of everything the bank's doing, not, that, not just that particular investment. But then the next stage in that argument is, well, okay, if the bank does a lot of those almost risk-free investments, 
its actual average funding costs will go down because the market will recognize that it's then a risk, a less risky bank. And then the other side of the argument will say, well, that never happens. You know, the, the, the funding markets are very sticky. They're not efficient in that way. And we, you know, you can't assume that your funding costs will go down because you do less risky investments. So those are, you know, those are the so sort of arguments that were, that were around on both sides of this debate. Um, one important distinction here, and I think both sides agree that this is a distinction, is between what accountants call the fair market value of a derivative and what we've called the private value. In other words, the fair market value should be the value which um, is, is, is generally considered to be the correct value by market participants. Uh, the private value could be different for different financial institutions depending on other things they have in their portfolio, particular objectives they're trying to meet, maybe even their funding costs as well. So you can see that uh, there's a lot of accounting issues that come into this. Sometimes regulatory issues are brought in. And then the sort of basic, um, you know, fundamental finance theory. So, so are there any particular adjustments that uh, you would make to the prices of derivatives given uh, traditional models like Black Scholes? That's a good question. Um, I mean, a traditional model such as Black Scholes assume that when two sides enter into a derivatives transaction, they're both going to live up to their obligations. Neither of them will default. So one adjustment that uh, the, the derivatives industry has become progressively um, more uh, sophisticated in in making is the credit risk adjustment. So we've got two adjustments, CBA and DVA. CBA is a fairly straightforward one. CBA says, if I enter into a portfolio of derivative transactions with you, uh, you might default, and you might default at a time when I have an exposure in that uh, you know the value of the transactions have a positive value to me and a negative value to you. So. I have to take that into account in valuing the transaction. So I would value the transactions first, assuming that neither of us will default. And then I'll subtract this thing called CVA, credit value adjustment, to reflect the possibility that you might default. And then I say, well, as a <coughs> symmetry would suggest that you know I should also make an adjustment for the fact that I myself might default. And that's actually a benefit to me. And so and that's called DVA. So that's something we would add to the value of the derivatives portfolio. So the actual derivatives portfolio, I mean, everybody would agree that, and accountants agree that we should first calculate the no default value of a derivatives portfolio, subtract CVA, and add DVA. Now, I might go one stage further and say there could be an adjustment for liquidity risk as well. Um, it's, uh, although liquidity, you know, the liquidity risk adjustment is very difficult to estimate, but uh, if we suppose that a bank has some deadweight cost of borrowing that is, you know, unrelated to credit risk, we're calling it liquidity risk, and it's something which all banks have, everybody in the marketplace right now uh, has to pay this liquidity premium, regardless of the uh, of the credit risk. Then you could argue that that's a deadweight cost of borrowing and it should be taken into account in any investment decisions that you make. Um, so it's, it, it is a, a situation where funding and investment do interact, if you like. The real problem is it's very difficult to actually estimate what the liquidity premium is in the market at any given time, because <clears throat> you want to, you've got to distinguish between the liquidity premium and uh, the credit risk premium, because when markets become stressed, the credit risk premium goes up. Uh, as well as potentially there being a liquidity premium. But what, what, what some people have tried to do is to estimate the liquidity premium as uh, the uh, excess of the um, bank's borrowing credit spread over the CDS spread, sometimes called the CDS bond basis. In other words, the bond yield spread uh, the excess of the bond yield spread over the credit default swap spread. Um, and if 
So the CDS bond base is actually calculated the other way around. So it could be the extent of the negative CDS bond basis is a measure of the liquidity spread. The only problem with that, I mean, that's about as close as you can get. The only problem with it is that, uh, you know, the CDS spread itself is influenced by supply demand factors, which are unrelated to liquidity in the bond market. So it's very difficult to separate everything that's going on out there. And John, I, I, I know uh, you had a recent guest contribution in terms of uh, Amazon.com's uh, Money and Markets blog uh, where you've raised some of the forthcoming issues of, of managing liquidity. Well, would, you, uh, would you categorize this as uh, the next greatest challenge in the OTC markets? No, I think it already is, as a matter of fact, a big challenge in the OTC markets. Um, I think all the regulatory changes which are going on right now um, in the OTC markets have really raised the importance of liquidity, huge amount. And you, Basel III, as you may know, is has got two liquidity ratios, which banks will down the road have to adhere to, uh, you know, the li liquidity coverage ratio and that stable funding ratio. So banks are obviously going to be, have to be a lot more conscious of liquidity because of those ratios, but there's other reasons as well. Um, transactions in the OTC derivatives markets, some of them will be going through central clearing parties, many more of them than have done in the past, and um, some of them will be continued to be bilaterally cleared. But whichever, whichever um, category they're in, the regulations require more collateral. So banks will have to post more collateral for the derivatives that they've entered into. Um, and in fact, as far as uh, central clearing parties are concerned, that collateral has to be pretty liquid stuff. It has to be, you know, cash, typically cash and government bonds. And banks have to be ready at a moment's notice to provide more collateral if the CCP asks for it. So you can see how that um, creates a lot more pressure to hold liquid assets in your balance sheet. And, you know, it means that, uh, you know, holding things like, um, loans to corporations, mortgages, and so on in your balance sheet, which are inherently illiquid, will be very unattractive. So there's going to be a lot of pressure to securitize those and, uh, and that sort of thing. So, I, you know, I see a big, uh, you know, liquidity becoming progressively more important. And it, it'll be interesting to see how financial institutions trade off liquidity and capital. You can imagine that there could be a project that comes along which will actually reduce your regulatory capital, so it's an attractive project from that point of view, but it might actually uh, increase liquidity requirements, and then you have to think about the trade-off between the two. And I think we'll see a lot more discussion of that sort of thing going forward. Well, John, I want to thank you so much for uh, taking some time with us and, and speaking to the Numerics audience. And, uh, and clearly, I'm sure we'll be seeing uh, many more comments from you on, uh, uh, on the pages within Risk Magazine and uh, uh, as well as uh, in, your, in your published offering. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, and uh, uh, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for joining in and tuning into uh, the Numerics video blog. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, John. Thanks, Jim.